I just got pooped on, and welcome to uh, Bird Tricks Tuesdays. I'm Dave Womack. This is Jinx, as you know. Today we're going to change it up a little bit. Yep, that's right. Right there for your viewing pleasure. And a little bit right there. Yeah. That's, that's bird life right there. But hey, I just want to go ahead and start today with, uh, with our winning comment. We're going to change it up a little bit. Today's winning comment um, is pretty cool. Basically, it says, thanks for the video. It tells me just one thing, that I was right to do flight training. I've used all your videos, and now my recall is really good. My Connor will fly to me from anywhere in the home, and every time I call him, he can come down to my hand from doors and picture frames when I sit on the floor to make it harder for him, which is awesome. Uh, I also have done a really big breakthrough. I also, I also have had a really big breakthrough. <laughs> I also have had a really big breakthrough today. I'm able to get him to fly to his cage and give... Wow, can I not read? I also have had a really big breakthrough today. I'm able to get him to fly to his cage and give him the cue. Wow. <laughs> it was a good comment, nonetheless. <laughs> and so we just wanted to let you know. Email us, info at birdtricks.com, and uh, let us know what product you want, and we'll go ahead and send it out to you. Take 18. Wow. So right now we want to take a couple of follow-up questions from last week and hopefully we can answer them for you. Is it possible to free fly small birds? So we get this question a lot. Is it possible to free fly small birds? And yes, you totally can. Um, it's just not smart unless you want to feed the hawks. No, but all, ser all seriousness, uh, you don't want to be flying uh, parakeets or really, really small birds like love birds, that kind of thing. It's just not safe. Um, we recommend that you fly larger birds. Like for us, honestly, we have 10 different birds that we free fly. And for us, we love flying the macaws because they're, they're bigger, they're stronger, it's safer. Yes, they can fly further distances. Uh, but they can all fly pretty far. But um, with the bigger birds, it's nice because if they go down or they're trying, they get lost, they can call for you a lot louder than a little parakeet could. Or, um, or again, like a, like a love bird or something smaller, a parrotlet. Just can't quite call the distance that these guys can. So we prefer to free fly the larger birds. And also it's safer for them because if there's a predator in the area, these guys are a lot harder to catch if you are a, um, a raptor. It's very important that... <laughs> it's very important they fly off in the shot. Uh, but it's important that the birds are there to make you lose your train of thought. <laughs> this is like the best Bird Tricks Tuesday ever so hard to focus. So one of the questions we had was if we could give you the very specifics for training a bird for outdoor free flight. Um, we do have the outdoor free flight course that we offer to people and again we've mentioned this in, the, in other videos but the reason that we do the outdoor free flight course as an actual course is because every bird is so different and we want to make sure that everybody's getting the right one-on-one -on -one coaching that is required to be able to get your bird to fly safely outdoors. But that being said, it is really important to be able to free flight train your bird to fly inside. And it basically starts with touch train your bird. If your bird understands how to go and touch the end of a stick, you can get that bird to go in and out of the cage. You can also get the bird to go to the floor, back to the perch, up to the railing, back down to your hand. All of these things are very important for any bird that is fully flighted that's indoors. You want to make sure that you train ascending, flying up. You also want to train descending, which is probably the most important skill that most people forget to train, and that's so your bird can fly down to you. Uh, a lot of times when you hear that birds get loose and accidentally get out of the house and they fly, fly away, you hear all the time that they circle and the bird's calling and the bird doesn't seem like it wants to fly away but it can't get down. And that's because most people miss this important step of training the bird to descend. Don't fall into the trap of thinking because you have a bird and naturally it flies in the wild that it understands how to fly. You have to help coach and guide your bird to be able to fly up but more importantly to be able to fly down. Also flying in the wind, there's so many things that, that become problems when you get to outdoor flying. But you can do a lot of this stuff indoors, and again, I strongly encourage this, so if your bird accidentally gets outside, you're good. But you should be working on things like recall. You need to be able to call your bird once and say the bird's name and have it come to you. And we use the bird's name as the come command, so we're not saying, come, come, come. We're just saying the bird's name. So, for example, if we have three birds out, we can say Jinx, and he'll fly to us. Or Comet, and Comet will fly to us. Or Tusa, and Tusa will fly to us. So it's important to really work on that recall and get the recall very strong. You want to use uh, all of the tricks and uh, tips and tricks that we use through our Taming Training and Tricks course, which is hard to say, but we want you to try all of those things and, um, and just really work on getting the bird's recall to be consistent. 
Our Total Transformation Parrot Seminar really goes in depth into a lot of these things. Um, but to try to give you the Cliff Notes version of it, just really work on making sure that your bird is responding on the first time you call them or the second time. What happens, and one of the big failure points that a lot of people have, is they say, you know, they say the bird's name. We'll just say, you know, um, Fluffy. <laughs> Fluffy, 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 fluffy. And the more you say it, the more the bird says, it gives you the feathered finger. It just says, no, I'm not gonna come. I'm gonna come when I feel like it. So you wanna make sure that you're reinforcing when the bird comes the first time you call it. Worst case, the second time you call it. When you can do this indoors and, uh, and successfully, then you're getting closer to where you need to be outdoors. We just really don't wanna encourage people to do the outdoor flight because it is so dangerous for the bird if it's not done properly, but it doesn't mean that you can't enjoy flight, and we try to encourage you to do that inside. Cool. Oh, it's already going. Um, yeah. So this topic, <laughs> <laughs> this week's topic. It's one of those Tuesdays. <laughs> it's always one of those Tuesdays for us. Um, this week's topic is basically stopping screaming, because we get so many screaming questions. Um, and we decided to let Jinx hang out with us today while we did this video because... By hang out, we mean poop on us? Because I actually recently taught Jinx to talk. And that kind of go coincides with screaming because one of the things that we tell people is to teach your bird to talk or to whistle or to sing or do anything as far as noise making that you find desirable um, instead of screaming so that you can replace the behavior. So I'm going to see if he will do it right now. It's not on cue yet. <laughs> As she lies, it is on cue. I've been working on getting it on cue, so it appears. I don't know if you like could hear it there, but he says "bubba." Huh. That, that was, was bub. That was not a very good one. So what uh. I'm <laughs> what I'm trying to do is have the cue be this. Bubba. Bubba. Okay. Anyways. So as you can see, you should follow us and learn everything that we do because it's perfect. It's not there yet. We're still in the training part of it. Bubba. Bubba. Give you like half one for that. So basically, um, one of the things that we've done with, well, one of the many things that we have done with our birds, our birds are not screamers. Um, and the, the way that we've accomplished this is by encouraging behaviors that we want. We have never, ever, ever encouraged screaming with our parrots, which means we've never gone and given them attention um, or any sort of reward or reinforcer when they are screaming. Which is, which is easy to accidentally do. I mean, if the bird's screaming, the most common thing that people do is they go into the room, they tell the bird to shut the hell up, <laughs> and they slam the door. And so what that does is encourages accidentally to reinforce the experience of the bird screaming because the bird's screaming for one reason or another, but then the bird quickly learns on the very first time that if it screams, you go there and it therefore gets your attention. It doesn't understand the difference between getting your attention and then you shut the door. It looks at those as two different, two different events. So screaming gets your attention. And then now you're there, you're upset with a bird, you slam the door. And so it looks at that as two different isolated events. And so what happens is uh, it ends up kind of messing up with the bird and um, confusing it quite a bit, but also you're reinforcing the screaming on accident, and it really only takes just that one time to be able to make that bird accidentally scream for your attention. For sure. So that's something that we've made sure to never do with our with our birds. Not to say that other people haven't done it with our birds, so we have to be super, super careful. Um, also, our birds spend a majority of their time in outdoor aviaries, which means they are they want to scream basically when the sun comes up and when the sun goes down, naturally they want to do that. And to avoid that, I've always fed them either in foraging toys or a half hour before those events are going to happen so that they're busy eating and they miss that opportunity to scream at that time so that they're quiet. Um, that's another thing, I guess, leading into it is we've always offered a lot of foraging opportunities to our birds so they're busy during the day. If your bird has nothing better to do than scream, you need to offer it some toys and, and mostly some foraging toys because then it's actually working towards something, it's actually doing something. Keep in mind that in the wild, birds spend like 80% of the day foraging. They're flying around, they're looking for food, they're breaking into things, they're figuring things out to try to eat. And so in captivity, it's important that we are able to try to simulate that as much as we can, so by providing foraging toys and a lot of toys in general, but even just taking your basic toys, like we've got a toy line that, that we encourage, actually I think Chet did a video on it, where he cuts open the toys, he stuffs food inside of it, but basically take any toys that you have, whether they're our product line or anybody else's product line, 
and try to figure out the best ways you can hide food in it because it's important that your bird can get his entire meal through foraging toys. By keeping the bird busy, it won't be bored because a lot of birds scream out of boredom. And so by getting rid of the boredom, you can also help curb that screaming by pretty substantially. Definitely. Another reason that a lot of parrots will scream is because they're irritated with their cage mate. So what we've done is we always make sure to house our birds individually so that they get plenty of time by themselves and they aren't yelling at the other birds that are within the aviary with them. Um. One other thing we do too, it doesn't totally relate to screaming so much, but um, it, it does reflect on some other things that may be of an issue for, for some of you. If you have multiple birds, don't always keep them in the same cage, rotate them into different cages. So here, when we're traveling, it's easy to do this, but we've got the, the cage from Cages by Design. There's four different cages, and we rotate who's in what cage all the time, so there's never any possession or territorial issues towards that cage. This obviously deals, deals a little bit more with like anger and aggression, but um, it could actually lead into some screaming issues as well. So by constantly changing your bird's environment, you avoid having it be a, a constant like territorial issue yeah and so just for what it's worth that's a good tip for just general welfare of your bird even if it doesn't totally 100 percent apply to screaming i love that i've also noticed with our particular macaws especially um they get more vocal when they want a bath <laughs> um when they really want to take a bath so i've noticed when our birds are out in the aviaries they'll get a little bit more vocal when they're just craving to be soaked down so um, it's kind of really, well, it, it's really important to understand the noises that your birds make and the certain differences in screaming. So our galahs, for instance, Bondi and Bandit, they do like celebratory screams, which are really cute and funny because we understand that they're literally celebrating at the time. So it's cute to us. Um, they also have a super high pitched alarm call if they see a predatory bird or something just spooks them and or they're letting everyone know. An airplane at 10,000 feet. Yeah, same thing to them. <laughs> Um, they make this really high-pitched alarm call. So it's just kind of understanding what noises your bird makes so that you can be a little bit more tolerant of ones that are just naturally going to happen. Um, also, one of the things we do to keep screaming from annoying us is we do keep our birds in aviaries all the time and we have them outdoors when, whenever weather, weather permitting. Um, this way, if they are making noise, it just doesn't bother us because they're not right there. So I highly encourage an aviary. I think it will save many people's sanity. Unless you live where there's an HOA, then uh, I discourage this. No, you just talk to your neighbors. Yeah. Make friends. So we've lived like in Orlando, we had the birds out 360 <laughs> days a year. There were a couple days where it would, it would freeze. Um, so we'd bring the birds in for that. But for the most part in Orlando, we'd, we just kept them outside. We had very limited neighbors with the way our, our layout was, but definitely talk to your neighbors and just kind of make sure that, hey, you know, they're going to scream at sunrise and they're going to scream at sundown. And really that should be it. And that's like Jamie was saying, you know, the best thing is having the aviary. You can't accidentally reinforce the screaming because it doesn't affect your daily life because they're outside and you could be in the kitchen, you could be in the bathroom, you could be in the bedroom. It doesn't matter. Their screaming doesn't get reinforced accidentally because it's quiet enough, you can just tune it out. You can look through the window and see, okay, is there a dog trying to get into the cage or things like that. But basically that, by ignoring the screaming, that's pretty much the number one way to avoid having the birds accidentally get reinforced. And so outdoor aviaries are definitely a, uh, they're, they're the top of our priority list. If you had one thing you could do to keep your bird from screaming, I would say put it in an outdoor aviary. The sunlight's gonna make it feel better. It's just the whole thing, it's not gonna get accidentally reinforced. And think about it too, like, if every time your child whines at you, you give it Play-Doh, uh, your child's gonna just constantly whine at you every time it wants Play-Doh. And so with the bird, if it's outside and it's whining or screaming about something and you just don't simply hear it, uh, it's not ever gonna get reinforced. And eventually that whole thing basically kind of goes away. Um, but not instantly, but you'll notice huge, huge leaps and bounds forward if the bird is in the outdoor aviary. For sure. All right, so when we first put together the Bird Tricks Tuesdays videos, we thought that we would come to you for two months and see if, uh, if people like this, if you guys are interested in it and want to hear more, um, definitely let us know and we'll continue to do it. But um, it's been interesting because we wanted to share what our life's about. And we realized through doing these Bird Tricks Tuesdays videos, a lot of you have no idea what it is that we really do. So I want you to stay tuned because next Tuesday we are going to do a video where it's a day in the life. It's a week in the life, but day by day. So you see every day what we do and, and just kind of real quick behind the scenes things and it'll have a lot to do with our 
our profession as magicians and also as parrot trainers. So you can really get a sense of what it is that we do. And of course, there'll be a lot of tips and tricks along the way that you'll learn from just basically how we care and train with our birds and a little bit of our bird show so you can see what the training is like here out um, in, in the, on the ships. Uh, Jinx last year was in 11 countries, which is pretty unique for birds. And so we'll share a little bit of the inside of that, but we'll try to give you kind of a day at a time so you can see our week in the life of the Womax, I guess. Yeah. But I guess the short of it would be that we're performers. Don't blow it. They're going to watch it next week. But you don't know what we perform? Or they do? Uh, I think crap. Can, can we cut the... Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next Tuesday. Good boy.